Allora, benvenuti al secondo corso, per chi è già, ha già seguito il corso di Seed Saver, spero vi piaccia tutto il progetto e quindi mi auguro di ritrovare anche tutti quanti ai prossimi corsi su Banca del Tempo, Eolico Cooperativo e Colture in Arido, che stiamo pianificando. Sì. Stiamo pianificando praticamente... Come vi ho detto abbiamo sostituito il corso di Dave Jake con uh, Passa l'acqua e Giulio Fittipaldi, ragazzo che è venuto al, allo scorso corso, quindi faremo una cosa sulle colture arboree, erbacee, quindi così, non, non, non so bene il programma, però loro lo stanno realizzando insieme. Um, che altro? Allora, per quanto riguarda le questioni tecniche relative alla giornata, Uh, farò passare il foglio delle presenze che dovrete firmare uh, poi uh, per quanto riguarda la traduzione simultanea è necessario lasciare un documento per avere le cuffiette quindi per chi volesse la traduzione in italiano lasciate un documento e prendete le cuffiette uh, scusate non ve l'ho detto prima ma non lo sapevo nemmeno io um, che altro? Uh, Vabbè, come al solito abbiamo dell'acqua lì, vi prego di riutilizzare il vostro bicchiere e quindi metterci il nastro con il vostro nome perché poi lo, lo utilizziamo per il pranzo. A proposito del pranzo, se c'è qualcuno che vuole aggiungersi ce lo faccia sapere ora perché stavolta noi abbiamo contattato una tavola calda, quindi siccome la volta scorsa abbiamo passato le giornate a a fare le cose del, relative al pranzo abbiamo deciso di fare in questo modo stavolta quindi se qualcuno vuole aggiungersi ok uh, mi scrivete il nome un attimo tutto l'elenco um, a metà giornata ci sarà la pausa caffè come la volta scorsa e si pranzerà di là nel, nell'amione se avete bisogno del bagno qui fuori c'è il compost toilet qui uscendo subito a destra, e, eh, penso nient'altro, non so che altro dire, e, credo di dover passare la parola a Brad, per, ah no ok, prendete le cuffiette poi, ok. Allora vorrei cominciare con dire una cosa, cerchiamo di, funziona? È vero? cerchiamo di essere puntuali uh, tutti i giorni, cerchiamo di essere quelle nuove e di dare una buona impressione perché siamo sempre un po' in ritardo e vorrei cominciare anche con un applauso a Brad che è venuto dall'Arizona dove non piove quasi mai e si è già beccato la nostra prima pioggia ci ha portato un po' di pioggia, grazie Brad to bring us the rain <ride> yesterday e ci farà lavorare tanto, quindi preparatevi, sarà fisico. E grazie per essere ritornati e per chi non è venuto di essere venu venuto l'altra volta di essere qui oggi con noi e di far continuare quindi questi laboratori dal basso. E buona giornata a tutti e grazie di nuovo Brad. All right. <ride> Okay, um, it, thank you all for coming today and uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you. Um, so I wanted to begin uh, by giving you uh, an outline of what we will cover in this workshop. So uh, today we are mainly going to focus on assessing the site. So what is happening on the site? Uh, I want you to be able to better read how the water flows across the land so that you can then decide what is the appropriate strategy. Okay? I purposely don't want to focus too much on how you harvest the rain today. I think it's more important that you learn to observe the land, the water flow, so that you can understand what is unique about this site and what is unique about your site when you go back home. Okay, and then, so we'll give, do a presentation this morning. 
We'll do some simple demonstrations outside, and then we'll walk the land and assess what is happening with the flow of water and sediment. Uh, and uh, then we'll start using some simple tools that let you figure out uh, slope and differences in elevation. It's a very inexpensive tool that you can make for uh, less than 20 euro, okay? Um, then tomorrow, we will go into creating water harvesting earthworks. We will use different strategies to plant the rain, okay? And these same strategies we can use to harvest and plant gray water which is the water from your sink drain, shower, bathtub, washing machine. We can reuse that water, okay? Um, and uh, we, will, um, we will create some simple uh, earthworks or catchment strategies out on the land. We will use different types of strategies so you can become more accustomed to deciding what strategy is appropriate in what context. Okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, then, so tomorrow will be all earthworks, all planting the rain. And we'll cover many different strategies on how you can do that. And then uh, the next day, we will do gray water harvesting. Okay, so that's the water from your drains. It's not the water from your toilet drain. Okay, that's, that's black water, and that's harder to deal with. So we will just look at gray water. And even if gray water harvesting is not legal where you are, don't worry. Okay, because we will show you how you can harvest gray water in a very safe way um, that will work anywhere. So where I'm from, it used to be illegal. Okay, now it's legal throughout the state um, because it's very safe and you can save a lot of water. So I will also talk about how we change the law to, uh, on that day. Because I find a lot of times what's uh, most challenging is not learning new material or new strategies. It's instead that the current laws um, don't yet allow some strategies. So I think it's important we inform ourselves on what works and what doesn't and why. So we know what will work and what will not work, but also so we can inform our policymakers so we can change laws when appropriate. Okay. Uh, and it's now not only is gray water harvesting legal in where I'm from, but you get paid to do it. <laughs> okay. So you get a uh, thousand US dollars uh, for if you harvest gray water, and if you harvest rainwater, you get two thousand US dollars. Okay. Why do you get paid? <laughs> it's because you are improving the conditions for the community at large. You're reducing flooding. You're reducing the use of expensive pumped water. You are re reducing the problems of too much water in the sewer system. Helps everybody. Okay. Okay, and then the last day, we will focus, oh, sorry. We will learn about gray water harvesting on the gray water day. And then we will also all figure out how to assess this site and your own site 
So at the end of the day, you will be able to determine what is appropriate for your home and how to do it. Okay? And then the last day, we will focus on rainwater harvesting for drinking, for bathing, uh, collecting the rainwater in tanks, in cisterns. Okay? All right. Um, and uh, if any of you uh, are coming to this workshop and you don't feel you're getting the information that you came for, let me, let any, or any of the organizers know. I want to make sure you get the information you, you came for. And if I'm not giving you the information, let, let me know so I can change the presentation. Okay? All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, I now want to get an idea of who you all are. <laughs> and there's a lot of you here, so I'll have to do this quickly. So, can you raise your hand if you are a farmer? Okay. Okay. Can you raise your hand if you are... Um, a, uh, a designer, like an architect, landscape architect. Okay. Uh, how about if you are um, here because you are a homeowner and you're interested in doing this at your home? Okay. All right. Okay. What about a, a student? Any students here? No? Used to be. <laughs> okay. Ex students. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, then, yeah. Um, some of us are home gardeners. Mm. Actually, we have a lot of people who want to garden. Okay. So let's, yeah, let's have you raise your hand if you're a home gardener. <laughs> All right. Okay. Awesome. That's just about everybody. And uh, uh, how many of you already have some experience harvesting rainwater or gray water? Okay. All right. Okay, good to know. All right. Um, so uh, now I want to try a little uh, experiment. Okay, we'll see if it works. Um, so... Uh, what, um, what I want to do now is ask um, a few questions that I want you to answer, but I don't want you to answer to me. I instead want you to answer the question to the person sitting next to you. Okay? And if you're sitting next to someone you know, turn the other direction and talk to the person you don't know. Okay? Um, so, I, I want you to pair up with that person and for two minutes, more or less, you will answer the questions. And then I'll say, stop, and the other person uh, shares. And I want you to l listen carefully so that you can try and listen for something that resonates with you, something that... Um, yeah, is, is right for you as well, that the other person is saying. And then, if appropriate, if you want to share afterwards, I'll ask four people to share what was shared in their pair. Does that make sense? Okay. The reason I'm doing this is I want a, an opportunity for you to get to know somebody else. Um, but these questions also enable me to learn more about you. Okay? So the first question is, why are you here in this workshop? <laughs> okay? And maybe you're going to answer, because I want to learn about water harvesting. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> okay? But why? Do you want to learn about water harvesting? 
what, what do you care about? That's more what I want to know. And what's your relationship with water now? Okay? And the last question is, what, what is the desired effect you want to have with the information, the experience you get in this workshop? Okay? So, it's not, I want to build a cistern or a reservoir, but what's the effect you want to have? That's more what I want to know. Okay? You, are you good? Okay, so now turn to the person next to you that you know the least. <laughs> and uh, let's take about two minutes to share with that person, and then we'll switch after two minutes. So go. So, how, how's the speed? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, all right. You <laughs> see me well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, switch, switch people.
Okay, try to finish up. So here's where you'll need to translate for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, now if, if any of you would like to share uh, something that resonated with you, that your partner shared with you, uh, now's an opportunity to, to share that. Anyone want to share? Yeah. Allora, quello che dicevamo noi fondamentalmente il, la necessità nella nostra zona è quella di recuperare l'acqua piovana. E l'esigenza per me nasce dal fatto che comunque il costo dell'acqua oggi da noi è altissimo. E che comunque non è, non è così, dal punto di vista ambientale non è così corretto perché immettiamo molti sali nei terreni. E, Diciamo, eh, la nostra esigenza era meno relativa alle acque grigie perché facevamo questo ragionamento. Probabilmente in Italia è più difficile recuperare le acque grigie per come, forse, per come sono fatte le case rispetto agli Stati Uniti che sono in legno. Per fargli capire eh, dove viviamo, noi in Puglia abbiamo eh, una media di piogge eh, all'anno di 600 mm di acqua. Ah, lo sa. Eh, noi comunque per due anni, nel 2007 e nel 2005, abbiamo avuto 300 mm di acqua. E Ah, la, il problema è che negli anni, negli ultimi dieci anni, eh, c'è stata una diminuzione del 10-15% eh, eh, ed è una diminuzione che è ancora in corso. Sì. Eh, quindi il nostro problema è che in questi anni, in questi ultimi anni, stanno seccando come mai prima, stanno seccando alberi di mandorli, eh, che sono, i eh, ciliegi già sono più delicati. Comunque... E I mandorli eh, notoriamente hanno bisogno di poca acqua per... Eh, quindi mh, io personalmente come altre persone eh, eh, per eh, come è costruttivamente fatta la casa eh, abbiamo, recuper recuperiamo le acque grigie ma abbiamo il problema del eh, accumularle e rilanciarle 
perché si formano eh, delle platine di, di sostanze organiche eh, che la rendono difficile da, da rilanciare. Eh. tenendo conto che i saponi li facciamo a base di soda e olio. Chi li facciamo tutti? Sì. Uh, we use soaps that are made come uh, soda and alcohol. Mm -hmm. e quindi siamo costretti a uh, consumare subito l'acqua che recuperiamo. So we have to immediately reuse the water that we gather because these things don't form these plants or whatever. E poi se esiste un sistema, cioè in questa zona noi abbiamo le cisterne sotto, sotto il terreno. Ma sono molto costose. E se esiste un sistema per accumulare l'acqua d'inverno in, un, in uno stagno a cielo aperto e resistere a sei mesi di siccità grazie no volevo um, Chiedere una curiosità, eh, il fatto di Petra, la città di Petra del discorso della Rugiada, se può essere adattabile anche qui, eh, cioè in Italia? Yeah. So I'll, I'll cover that briefly, at, uh, probably, probably tomorrow, I'll cover some of the dew harvesting too. Yeah, tomorrow. Oh, she's saying, you know, that we were supposed to tell you about the questions and things we said to each other, not yep. so much questions for you. Yeah. Oh. So, um, yeah, so any, any last person want to share any uh, of the impressions they had from what this other person shared with them? Eh, non abbiamo eh, bisogno di utilizzare tutta l'acqua che utilizziamo eh, e come la utilizziamo in un paese come eh, il nostro, come la Puglia. Molto spesso facciamo degli usi spropositati d'acqua e non ce ne rendiamo conto. Potremmo appunto eh, utilizzarla meglio e imparare a, a riutilizzarla. E anche il mio compagno qui uh, pensa che effettivamente sia importante perché loro andranno anche a vivere in uh, campagna dove c'è una precipi precipitazione <laughs> annua molto bassa di, di, di acqua. Okay, now translate. Ah, ok, so basically here, especially in, in Puglia, I think we use too much water um, without good reason, like we leave it, even the tap open while we wash the dishes and stuff like that. So we should really learn how to not to do it. And uh, more than that, we can learn how to recycle it, to reuse it, and uh, so maximize the opportunity of the water we're using as we're actually living in a place where there's not much, much water. Yes. in italiano poi lascio tradurre in inglese a chi 
per quanto riguarda il, quello che hai detto su Petra, io sono di Mantera e abbiamo un, un, un esempio molto simile dalle nostre parti, cioè Puglia, quasi al confine con la Puglia. Il sistema di raccolta delle acque che noi abbiamo a Mantera è molto simile a quello di Petra, a quello che è stato fatto lì. Magari una visita potrebbe... potrebbe... <ride> Poi per quanto riguarda invece le, le cose da, che si possono chiarire, eh, un esempio particolare, io ho un, un pozzo che è stato scavato vicino casa per la raccolta delle acque di falda, volevo capire se è possibile riutilizzarlo per l'accumulo di acque piovane eh, o se bisogna sigillarlo in qualche maniera prima dell'utilizzo. Mm-hmm. And you said that Well, he said he has a cistern for rainwater, but he also has some kind of a um, pozzo, uh, a well that gathers water from the water table, mm -hmm. as far as I understand, from the water table, and he would like to use it to gather rainwater, but he wants to know if it needs to be um, adjusted, sealed inside with something, mm -hmm. so he can re use it to gather rainwater instead of the water table. The, the nearby the pool, so it is very, uh, it, uh, it dry the, uh, the water uh, under the pool, mm -hmm. and now everything is dry. Mm. So Okay, um, so I'll, I'll answer that question in just a moment. Um, but first off, uh, let me just explain uh, further why I wanted to do that exercise of having you oh, talk together. <laughs> Is uh, um, I mentioned earlier that we've changed the law in Arizona and we now gray water harvesting is legal where it was illegal before. Also, when we started harvesting rainwater, many people wouldn't listen, or it was too strange, too new an idea. So we had a lot of problems when we started, a lot of people trying to stop this practice. So what I was trying to do of having you all talk to one another is to see if you might, as you talked, find common ground common interests, common caring, by sharing what is important for both of you. And the reason I wanted to do that is that is how we were able to make change in Arizona, is when we talk to the city or the state to change the law, we did not begin the conversation by saying, we want to change the law, change it. We instead ask the people from the state, what are your concerns? What are your needs? And then they would tell us. We'd say, ah, well, here are our concerns, our needs. And we would focus on our shared concerns and shared needs. And we found it was much easier to have a dialogue this way. They heard us and we heard them. Uh, and as a result, change was much easier. Okay. I think some of this will become more clear when I share the story of what we changed in my hometown and how. Um, but also, I was trying to listen for common ground from what you shared and with, what's, and with me. So some of that is, as I will explain in the story, the water situation where I'm from is very similar to here. Our rainfall is becoming less. Our groundwater is salty. Um, uh, and, um, and we can, as can you, learn from other dry regions like Petra, in Jordan um, to harvest other waters, even the dew. You can harvest more dew than we can because you are closer to the ocean. So you have a lot more humidity in your air than we do. 
Um, so I'll, I'll cover some of that later. And your question about the uh, well, um, in India, it's very common to harvest water in wells. Um, but they are using the water table as their tank. And uh, there are some risks. If you send parking lot water into a well, you can contaminate your groundwater with the oil. Okay. There's no more groundwater below the well because everything is dry now. So you might be fine then, but if the water table ever comes back up, there might be an issue. So, um, but if you seal it, you can use it like a cistern. But then you have to break the seal if things get wonderful again in the future and the water table comes up. So, okay. So, uh, um, thanks for sharing. And now I want to uh, jump into the first presentation. Um, so, oh no, more questions. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, just think about these questions. You don't need to share them. But uh, I want you to ask yourself, what is the story of your place? Okay? And what is your relationship to the place where you live? And finally, what is your role in that story? So now I'm going to tell you a story, not the only story, of my place, Tucson, Arizona. Ah, it's hard to see. Ah, okay. Now, um, I hope you can see the slides now that the sun's out. It's a little harder. Uh, these two photographs are taken 100 years apart, more or less. So. In the early 1900s, that's what my community looked like. And we once had a river that flowed all year long. Okay? Even though I'm from a desert where we get 300 millimeters of rain a year, this place is the oldest continuously cultivated place in what is now the United States. Okay? It's been continuously cultivated far longer than wetter areas. Okay. And that's in part because of our climate. It's warm enough that we can grow a lot of different things. But also, there used to be much more water available in the form of the river. Also, the water table, the groundwater level, was just uh, uh, three meters below the surface in many parts of the basin. When we had abundant springs and artesian wells throughout the basin, and we had uh, forests of cottonwood, willow, hackberry, and mesquite trees. And these forests, when it rained, would diffuse the force of the falling raindrop. So it didn't hit bare earth and erode the soil. It, it hit the canopy of vegetation. And when it made its way through the canopy, it didn't hit bare earth. It hit a sponge-like layer of organic matter or mulch below. So back then, the majority of the rain that fell was absorbed by the land. Okay. Now, we've replaced the sponge with a drain. So the rain now doesn't hit much vegetation. It mostly hits rooftops, streets, pavement. Okay. And it rapidly runs off and is drained away, evaporated off. At the, s at the same time, we are over-pumping or over-consuming our groundwater at a rate that's faster than natural recharge. Okay. 
But unfortunately, while we're over pumping the water, we're simultaneously crippling the watershed's ability to naturally recharge itself. Okay? So, um, as a result, we, we've killed our river. We've killed the springs. We've lost the forests. And our water table is now 100 meters below the surface and drops a meter every year. Okay. So uh, we have moved from a sponge to a drain. And when we look more closely at our city, you can see that we are a hydrophobic society. We are afraid of water. Okay. Or we must be, because we design all our infrastructure so we get rid of the highest quality free rainfall as quickly as possible. So this is a commercial development. The rain just hits the pavement and it's gone. This is a housing development. So there's the house. The water comes off the roof, through a drain, past the plants, into the street, and the pipes shoot the water out of the system. Okay? So we are in a desert city, but because of infrastructure like this, we are making it a much drier city. Okay? And then it gets even drier because all this exposed asphalt, concrete, it absorbs the heat of the sun during the day and radiates it out at night. This has led to a five and a half degree Celsius increase in summer temperatures. Okay, that's, that's not global warming. That's local warming. Okay, just caused by too much exposed hardscape. So um, we then lose more water to evaporation because the temperatures are higher. Okay. Oops. So then we not only get drier, but when it rains, we get more floods. So this, everything drains to the streets, there's flooding for traffic, this is a problem, but it's also great for the new sport of urban runoff kayaking. Okay. Um, so floods that used to occur every 10 years, I'm sorry, every 100 years are now occurring every 10 years. Okay. But we're not getting more rain. It's just that when we do get the rain, we drain it off the land more quickly than used to be. Okay. And uh, Tucson, my city, is located right here. So that's Arizona. And we uh, historically drain water to the Colorado River, which goes to the Sea of Cortez. But now we are pumping water from the river uphill to Tucson. So this is the canal through the desert. We have to pump the water uphill to get to Tucson. As a result, this canal is the single largest consumer of electricity in the entire state of Arizona. And it is the single largest emitter of carbon in the state of Arizona through the coal burning power plant that generates the electricity or the pumps. Okay? is we have to raise the water uh, a thousand meters okay, to Tucson. Um, 
So keep in mind this uh, principle at the top. Distance is energy. The longer the distance we pump water, transport food, or transport electricity, the more energy it consumes. And this is why I love harvesting rainwater. It's the free local water. It delivered free of charge. Okay. Also, rainwater has no salt. So it's the best water for our plants. It's also a natural fertilizer. It contains nitrogen and sulfur, which is great for the plants. Um, all right. So uh, then uh, at the, uh, uh, this photo is in the Colorado River Delta, where the Colorado River meets the Sea of Cortez. And we are killing the Colorado River. There's only a fraction of the flow meets the sea anymore. So I find this very depressing. <laughs> Because we already killed our river, the Santa Cruz River, and now we, along with many other cities, are killing a much bigger river, the Colorado River, by pumping the more water out of it than goes back naturally. Okay, so that is a degenerative story, a degenerative potential ruin. What I mean by something that's degenerative is it destroys the world in which it is located. It consumes more resources than it produces. And it typically only serves one function. Okay? All right. So, um, when I look at that story of Tucson, it's a very degenerative story. Things are getting worse and worse over time. And if I live in Tucson, I then have to ask myself, is that my story, my role to forward that story? Because I'm a citizen of Tucson. Mm -hmm. And I say, no! <laughs> because I hate that story. And I don't want to be part of that story. So these numbers point to a possible different story. Uh, okay, so you don't need, don't worry about those numbers. I'll just explain. So in Tucson, in my community, my desert community, more rain falls on the surface area of the city in a year then all the people living in the city consume of utility water in a year. Okay? So we consume 424 liters of water per person per day in my city. But there's 874 liters of rainwater per person per day. Okay? If you can capture the rain when it falls, and make it available in the times of no rain. That's the challenge. Okay. And that's the challenge here. Because you don't have a water scarcity problem. You have twice the rainfall that we do. Okay. You have a water storage problem. Okay, you need to hold on to that rainwater longer. So these are the numbers for here. So you consume 250 liters per person per day, um, but you have over 6,000 liters per person per day of rainwater. All right. If you can capture that water and spread it out. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing, ah, oh, some potential. <laughs> All right. 
So now I, I talked about the degenerative depressing story of Tucson. Now this is an example of a small generative uh, strategy and story. What I mean by generative is this particular strategy is making things better. It's conserving more resources than it consumes. And it's generating more life, more resources than it consumes. Okay. So uh, this is a simple uh, rock dam that is put across a flow of water. And before the dam was put in place, water would flow for three hours after a rain and then stop. Now that the dam is here, we have a spring that has appeared. And the water flows from this spring for three weeks after a rain not just three hours. Okay. The difference is um, this has slowed down the water, so soil, seeds, sand has accumulated behind it like a terrace. The terrace rapidly absorbs water and slowly releases it in the form of the spring. Okay. So we don't have any more rain, but yet we have the water available for a longer period of time. Okay. And so then we have more vegetation growing, more wildlife visiting the vegetation, um, the wildlife pooping out manure, improving the fertility, providing us with meat or other things. So we're getting more and more resources. But we can do even better than that. Okay. We can create a regenerative strategy. And what makes the regenerative strategy so much better than a generative strategy is it produces more resources than it consumes. It improves the world in which it is located. And it's able to regenerate itself okay. because it's alive. Okay. And so what I will be talking about a lot in this workshop is strategies that can enhance more life. Okay. So what's here? It's uh, a much simpler rock structure. It's only one rock high, not many rocks high and uh, five rocks wide. But that little dam, that's not regenerative. That's generative because it's not alive. Okay? But it set up the conditions for all of this riparian grass to grow and that is the regenerative part. So the grass is much better than the rock at slowing the flow of sediment and water. So the, the rock slowed the water down, sediment dropped out, seeds germinated in the moist sediment. Then it grew into grass. The grass then slowed more water, slowed more sediment. More seeds germinated, more grass grew. It kept building on itself and building on itself, okay? So this is what it used to look like before the rock structures were put in. It's just bare bedrock. But after the structures went in, the riparian grasses returned. So in my community, in, in my country, of, well, my state of Arizona, we have lost over 90% of our wetlands and our perennial waterways in just 100 years. Okay. 
But here, my, my friend who's doing this work is at least bringing back some of these wetlands. So here he is standing on one of these one rock high structures. And the only reason, he put that in to set up the conditions that all this grass could grow. Now that the grass is there, we don't need the rock structure anymore. Okay? As long as the cattle don't eat all the grass again. We need, we need to keep some of it. And it's such a good sponge that we have, and there's so much water being held that the wetlands are growing uphill with capillary action of the water. <coughs> okay. So uh, again, that's only generative, but this living grass is the regenerative aspect. So I'll explain in the workshop how to create these and other structures. But what's more important is not the strategy, but realizing what's the potential we're trying to get to. And I think it's a living system that takes care of itself. Okay, so we should do a time check. Um, can we keep going? We're good? Okay, all right. So, all right. So now I want to transition to tell you a story of the man that taught me how to harvest water. Okay? Uh, it's this man, Mr. Zephania Piri Maseko. Okay? He is a subsistence farmer from Zimbabwe, Africa. And uh, he lives in an area where most people cannot access groundwater. He cannot access the groundwater. It's too deep, and he doesn't have enough money to access it. Um, so uh, he uh, has been able to turn a relative wasteland into an oasis simply by planting the rain. So I want to share his story with you uh, now. So here's a story. <laughs> In the 1960s, he was fired from his job working for, for the Rhodesian Railroad. Let's say it again? Okay, so in the 1960s, he was fired from his job working for the Rhodesian Railroad. Because at that time, Zimbabwe was called Rhodesia named after Cecil Rhodes, who may have had an ego problem, okay? So, um, Mr. Peary, he being politically active, promoting things the government was not for, he was fired and told he would never work again in any position. He was blacklisted. So he had to figure out how was he going to support his family of eight with no job. Um, and he looked to the only two things he felt he had. That was his small three hectare land holding and the Bible. The Bible he used as his gardening manual. Okay? So, he read the story of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, and he found, ah, they had everything they needed in this Garden of Eden. So what I need to do is to create a Garden of Eden. But as he thought about this, he wondered, how am I going to water this garden? Adam and Eve had the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in their region. I don't even have an ephemeral creek. So he, he realized he would have to create his own rivers. And he's actually done that in his own way, which I'll share with you. So uh, when, uh, when I met him, 
He was uh, sitting in front of a simple mud structure, which is his NGO office. And uh, he said, uh, I introduced myself, and he started laughing. Uh, he said, why did you come all the way from Arizona to see me? <laughs> um, and I asked to see his farm. So we went and saw it. And he, this is when he started to share his story. And eight, uh, eight simple principles for harvesting water. So I'll give you those eight principles now. And we'll give you a, a handout with them tomorrow. Okay? The first one is long and thoughtful observation. So it's key. You get out on the land and you see what's working and what's not working. So when it rains, where does water accumulate and generate or grow more life? That's probably working. Where does it drain away too quickly and cause erosion or flooding? That's not working. So you want to learn from what is working Build on that. Mimic that. Okay. And when things aren't working, try and change it. So uh, every time it rains, Mr. Peary is running around his land, watching how the water flows. Okay. And as he told me, he said, Brad, when it rains, you will always find me very wet because he's out in the rain. Okay, so above his land he has a big hilltop with very little vegetation growing on it because it's been overcut, overgrazed, poorly managed. So the water flows down very quickly and it causes a lot of flooding, a lot of erosion, and he, he used to lose small livestock, like chickens, every time it rained, because they would wash the chickens away, and sometimes other animals. So that was not working. But he noticed uh, the, the hill slopes this way. Sometimes there were rocks or a branch across the flow, and it slowed the flow enough that soil would accumulate on the upslope side. Moisture would linger longer in that soil. And a sponge started to form on what was previously a drain. The, uh, um, now the other thing you need to know is all these photographs were taken uh, after two years of drought and also in the winter when everything was dormant. So it looks drier than it, than it is normally. So then the next principle is you want to start at the top of your watershed and work down. So most of the time, if people have a slope here, I find they want to start harvesting the water there at the bottom because that's where they see all the water. But if you collect all the water at the bottom, how do you get it back up to the top? So I like to start at the top with different strategies. So when it rains, everything is hydrated nothing is flooded, okay? And if I put in a rainwater tank above ground, I like to put it on the high part of the property, not the low part, so I can send gravity-fed water into the tank, and I can use the gravity to distribute the water out of the tank to more area. I can always get a pump, but I don't want to be dependent on the pump. Everyone good? Any questions? No? Okay. 
Okay, so here is a drawing of Mr. Peary's land. There's the hilltop. We're going to look at these walls next, then come into the uh, family compound and work our way down. So um, this is looking up from the family compound to the top of the hill. And you can see how eroded it is. So he started creating these uh, rock walls, starting at the top and working down. So very similar to here, just terraces, basically. But he had no soil, <laughs> so it's not a terrace. It's just a wall. OK. Um, and uh, this is now looking from the top down. He did start to gather some soil behind that would be washed down, um, but it, it took a long time. And then plants started to germinate in that. But just by spreading the water out, he stopped losing chickens in big water flows because the water was slowed down, it was spread out. And it, it was slowed down enough that at the bottom of the hill, he could dig some reservoirs. Okay. Um, I'll show you the reservoirs again in a moment. The third principle is start with small and simple strategies. So why start with a small and simple strategy? So you start! <laughs> okay. If it's too big and complex, you get intimidated. You never start. But if it's small and easy, okay, we'll start. So <coughs> he, he would plant the appropriate plant in a simple basin. That's a good way to start. He, he started with one simple low wall at the top of his hill. That's a good place to start. Okay. Um, and around your home, you probably don't have a big hill above your land. But you do have a roof. And within uh, three, let's see. Within nine meters around your home, um, that's the best place to begin harvesting water. Because you have the rainfall and the runoff from your roof, doubling the amount of water, rainwater. Okay? So come three meters away from the building before you make a, bi a basin, because you don't want to soak the soil under your wall. Come three meters away. Then maybe it's appropriate to make some basins, to make these bowl-like shapes in the land. You can direct rain and runoff to them and gray water. Okay? And again, you can start with just one, one small basin. But the key is, Try and start where you have more water, not just rainfall, but also run on. Um, so this, is, this won't translate, but uh, we have run off water is the water running off the roof. So we want to turn that run off into run on, because that's right on. And sorry, that won't translate. <laughs> it's a language joke. But for the English speakers. <laughs> What's it? Ah, that's fine. Okay, so it's no problem if your roof is flat. Okay? The raindrop does not see a slope, the raindrop just sees two dimensions. So as long as you have a downspout where the water is going, you can do it. 
Yeah. Yeah, Th that's enough. Even the most gradual slopes. So once the vegetation is grown, then things can look like this. You have the oasis around the house. Okay, but back to Mr. Peary. So here he is in one of his reservoirs. And this is at the key point in the landscape where the steep slope becomes more gradual. That point is the key point. So where it's steep, you're losing soil. Where it's more gradual, soil accumulates. So that's where he digs his reservoir. Yeah. Lo dico in italiano, ma come funzionano i fiumi? Cioè, i fiumi hanno una parte molto pendente all'inizio e poi accumulano acqua sotto. Quindi possiamo, simuliamo come il funzionamento dei fiumi. Mm -hmm. Chi deve tradurre? E se pensate a questo, se on the steep slope il soil is leaving then that's not where you want to build a dam wall because it will erode more quickly. You, it's better to build the dam on the more gradual slope where soil is more likely to stay in place. Okay? I don't know if that makes sense. You get that? <laughs> okay, so here he dug his reservoir and this is where he stands when it rains. So when it rains, He doesn't stand in the bottom, he stands up here. And he shouts to the rain. And he says, rain, welcome to my country. Now I will tell you where you will live. In the soil. Okay? And I talked to his neighbors and they confirmed that he does do this every time it rains. Okay? So he wants to get the water in the soil not on top of the soil. Because if it's in the soil, <coughs> he loses less of it to evaporation. Whereas if it's on top, it's evaporating. And in the big rainstorms, if he can get it into the soil, it moves very slowly in the soil, no erosion. But if it travels quickly on top of the surface, He loses his soil. He loses its erosion. This is also his immigration center. That's what he calls it. Which confused me. Because I thought he was teaching me about water, and then he starts talking about immigration. So I asked him to explain. And he said, no. Um, oh, I, I screwed up the story. That's why he shouts out to the rain, welcome to my country. I will tell you where you will live, is this is the point at which he is inviting the, so the water into his soil. And he knows if he fills this three times in a year or in a season, he has enough water stored in the soil of his land to last him through a two-year drought. But it's not because of just this reservoir. It's because of hundreds of strategies from the very top of his land all the way to the bottom. So he wants to change from a straight drain of the water out to slowing, spreading, and infiltrating the water. Uh, and that's one of the other principles. <coughs> so here are some ways that he slows, spreads, and infiltrates the water. So the water comes off his roof into the cistern, the rainwater tank. 
It then overflows to a basin to irrigate the, uh, the vine, which gives him fruit, shade, and a windbreak. And then that water overflows to other plantings. Uh, here, um, you're looking down slope, across the slope. He has a terrace, more or less, or a contour swale, a berm that slows the water so it pools and infiltrates instead of running off. In his drainages, where the the water channel flows. He creates rock check dams across the flow, like the check dams <coughs> you saw earlier in the talk. And he also reuses his gray water. So there's where they wash all the dishes and the clothes. And then there's a pipe coming to a uh, reservoir under his feet that uh, it's not sealed, it leaks. So the water just goes right into the soil so the roots of some trees can access the water. Now, uh, there's a huge fear of snakes here. So everything is kept very bare around the home. But you don't need to keep it that bare. Uh, Okay, the fifth principle, always have an overflow and use it as a resource. So I guarantee there are going to be rain events that are too big for your system to handle, no matter how big you make it. So if you put in a rainwater tank, your overflow pipe must be the same diameter as your inflow pipe. All too often, I see people make the overflow too small and the water backs up into or against the house. Then send that overflow water to another tank or to a basin to irrigate a tree to shade that tank. That can then send that water to another earthwork or rain garden to another to another. So we slow spread and infiltrate the flow of water. It's not just out. Yes? Yep. Uh, if we have an overflow, it, it means that. Uh, 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 dico in italiano: se abbiamo una, un esubero d'acqua, uh, l'acqua va nella canalizzazione che noi abbiamo previsto. Per, uh, e quindi sta irrigando in qualche maniera. Uh, if we have an, an overflow of water, it will uh, come down to the, to the canal that we have uh, uh, built. But if you have an overflow, uh, it, is the, it means that the reservoir is not, so, is not big enough to uh, contain all the water that uh, we... Uh, so I think we have to build a, m a bigger uh, reservoir mm -hmm. uh, so that we can, since it is raining, it's, it's not uh, uh, required that uh, water have to go there. Yeah. So um, I yeah. wonder that. So uh, you might not have enough money to build the reservoir as big as you want. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. So I would plan the overflow location so I can direct it to another tank I can install in the future. But even if I install a really big tank, um, there will still be unusually heavy rain events that's too big. So we always need an overflow somewhere. Um, and I will cover on the fourth day how to size your tank. <laughs> okay. All right. Then, uh, okay. Um, here, uh, Mr. Peary is standing by a drainage swale the government put in 
because there was so much bad flooding in the rainy season for people's farms that the government decided to uh, put in the drainage swales to divert the flood water out of the system. This did help control erosion and flooding, but unfortunately, it also dehydrated the farms of their only source of water. Okay. So, uh, right now we're looking here. So, this is a sw drainage swale the government put in to collect this flow of water, send it out to a concrete drain that shot the water out of the system. Okay? So, Mr. Peary, to rehydrate his land, dug these basins, which are uh, three meters, no, two meters uh, long and two meters deep. Okay. And uh, so when the water would flow down, this would fill with water and then overflow to the next basin and then the next and the next. So after the rain stopped and the water flow stopped, he had all these basins full of water. Okay, infiltrating into the land. Okay, so now we're going to move down here and end up here. The sixth principle is you want to maximize the living and organic ground cover. <coughs> so uh, we don't want just bare earth because we lose far more water to evaporation from the bare earth. But if we can have the sponge like layer of organic matter, we increase the rate at which water infiltrates and decrease the rate at which we lose it to evaporation. So uh, one way to increase this sponge is Mr. Peary grows hundreds of trees and shrubs in thrown away uh, grain bags which he gives away for free to anyone that wants them. The, the reason he does this is he wants to, he wants everyone in his community to respongify their part of the watershed. So I thought this was great until I learned that most of the trees that people plant die. So I asked Mr. Peary, why do they die? And he said, it's simple. People love to plant trees, but almost nobody plants the water. And you've got to plant the rain before you plant the trees in these simple shapes. Okay? So, um, uh, then his, his next principle is we want to make sure all our water harvesting strategies do more than harvest water. Or said a different way, make sure, uh, that's kind of a confusing way to say it, but just make sure everything performs multiple functions. So for example, if we have an above ground cistern and a tree in a rain garden, if we plant that on the east or the west side of the house, it can shade it in the hot morning or afternoon. So it's an air conditioner as well. We can also select a tree that produces food, wildlife habitat. And the tank and the rain garden can double as on-site flood control. 
So in parts of Germany, El Paso, Texas, and other communities, you are now taxed for every uh, uh, square meter of uh, land you have that drains water off property. Okay, because you're causing flooding downstream. But if you instead capture that runoff on site with rain gardens or tanks, there's no tax because you, you don't drain water, you don't cause flooding. I, I just mentioned this because this seems to be the way more communities are going. Okay, so here's Mr. Peary standing next to one of his hand dug wells. And his family is known as the family of water into which they can always dip their fingers. So uh, his uh, well, um, his well levels have been going up, but his neighbor's water levels have been going down. Not his next door neighbors, but more distant neighbors. His next door neighbors, their water is coming up as well. So why is his water coming up, but some people in the community it's going down? It's because he puts more water into the soil in a year than he takes out in a year. And this is how he's created his rivers. His rivers are a shallow lens of water beneath his surface. He has different geology than you do here. <laughs> he has granite bedrock. You have porous limestone. Okay, so it's different. All right. Um, but uh, he then uh, is able to tap that groundwater with uh, a donkey pump. He puts a hose into the well, moves this around with him or the donkey, opens and closes metal plates on the tire. It's like an accordion pump, and he can irrigate his gardens. And he, he grows um, many different varieties of crops every year. This connects with the workshop that was last week. OK. Uh, so it's very important to save your seed instead of buy your seed. Um, because he is able to save the seed from the plants that do best with his soils and his erratic irrigation so each year, his plants become better adapted to the unique conditions of his site. And he's able to use less water each year to grow his crops. Okay. Um, he also has found that um, if he uses organic fertilizer like manure or compost, he has much better crops than if he uses synthetic fertilizer. Because the organic fertilizer feeds the soil and adds organic matter to the soil, which enables the uh, soil to hold more water. The synthetic fertilizer does not feed the soil, does not add organic matter, so the soil can't hold as much water. So this is really important in this region. Okay. All right. And uh, then at the bottom of his site, he has three reservoirs. And this is where his rivers come to the surface. Okay, that's literally the groundwater level surfacing. Okay. So, uh, he plants a lot of shade trees and reeds around it to reduce water loss to evaporation and from the wind. And he raises fish in here. 
So where his, uh, he literally has, there's people in his area literally dying of thirst and he's able to raise fish. <laughs> and uh, there's three reservoirs at three levels. So when the shallowest reservoir goes dry, they put all the fish into the deeper reservoir. When that goes dry in, the, in a drought, they put all the fish into the deepest reservoir. And if that one also goes dry, they have a huge fish fry for the whole community. Everyone comes and eats. Okay. And then below the reservoirs, he has his small uh, banana plantation. So I thought this was amazing that in an area so dry, he's able to grow a, a small plantation of bananas. And it's all just on the rainwater he has caught and stored in his soil. <coughs> so I was amazed to see all this, to see the change he had made because it was all done just by him and his family. No outside inputs. And uh, I asked him, how long did this take? And he said, it took 30 years. And when I heard that, I said, 30 years? That's crazy. That's such a long time. And then he slapped me on the shoulder. And he said, Brad, that's life. Life is a slow process. You just have to start. And the key is, you start with long and thoughtful observation. You start at the top of your watershed and you work down. You start with small and simple strategies. You start by slowing, spreading, and infiltrating the water. You start by having an overflow and always using the overflow as a resource. You start with the living and organic ground cover. You start by always making sure uh, there is an overflow and using it as a resource. Did I already say that? No? Okay. <laughs> And everything serves multiple functions. And then the last principle, which is the same as the first, because it's a cycle, is the feedback loop, or once again, long and thoughtful observation. See what's working, build on that. See what's not working, change that. Okay? All right. So now I think we should take a break. So um, we'll take a, a break now. And uh, if you have questions for me personally, come on up or whatnot. How long do we take for the break? So 20 minute break? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's that? How can I see you guys? Because it is very server, because it is made uh, like uh, uh, a right. plan.
Okay, they're good. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, uh, just to finish up the story about the uh, African water farmer, um, <coughs> at the end of my visit with him, I was very impressed uh, with the, uh, the work that he had done. And uh, he told me a story about uh, some teachers at the local school who had come to him. He was a community leader. And they said that they were so disturbed by the poor conditions in the schools that they wanted to leave. They had been striking for a long time, but they wanted to leave. And it was because the, uh, the schools had no windows. They were very hot in summer, very cold in winter. There was no school lunch program. The students were very malnourished. If they even showed up to school, they would just sleep uh, in class. Uh, and uh, so they didn't want to be part of this. They wanted to leave. So Mr. Peary then said to them, please don't leave. Instead of running from your problems, why don't you try and find solutions? And he made a deal with them. He said, look, if you stay, I'll work with you, and we can uh, turn the school around. We can make things better. And uh, because if you leave, you're just going to turn wherever you go into what you're running from. So uh, half the teachers stayed, half the teachers left. And the teachers that left, they went to new settlements that were lush at the time. But in a few years, they had degraded the new settlements to the same bad conditions they'd run from.
whereas the student, the uh, teachers that stayed, Mr. Peary worked with them to harvest the water off the roof to create wind breaks that would shade the schools in the hot summer months, but let the winter sun in in the cold months. They planted a garden from the rainwater and the gray water. And they started a school lunch program from the food they grew in the garden. So the students attended school more, their health improved, the, uh, uh, the school improved. And the way Mr. Peary likes to tell the story is years later, some of the teachers that had left came back. And he says, with tears in their eyes, they thanked him for being a man of his word and working with the teachers that stayed to make things better. And they, they said, it was as he predicted. When they went to the new settlement, they, they soon destroyed it as well. So I love that story. And Mr. Peary finished it by saying, remember, the children are our flowers, so you've got to water them if you want them to bloom. <laughs> That's hard to translate. I don't know. Uh, and so I was inspired by his story and for whatever reason I decided to complain to him <laughs> I started to share the problems I was having in my community I told him about how bad the water situation was and how I didn't want to be part of that problem, the killing of the river, the dropping of the water table. And I told him that I was thinking of leaving because I didn't want to be part of the problem. And he then looked at me and asked if I'd heard the story he just told me about the teachers. And uh, he said, you're just like the teachers. If you run from your problems, you will just plant your problems everywhere you go. But if you instead try to find solutions, well, then you might be able to plant solutions wherever you go. So he then challenged me to go home to set my roots deeper than I had before and to try and find solutions. So I did. <laughs> I don't know why, but I was, I was ready for that kind of a challenge at that time. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but because I saw his example, I saw what he had been able to do I knew it was possible in some way. So I went home determined to try and figure things out. So this is the home I returned to. So I had just purchased this home with my brother uh, because neither of us could afford a house on our own. We, had, we were too poor. And even still, we could not buy a normal house. We had to buy a house that was about to be condemned because it was the only thing we could afford. So it looks okay, but when I opened the front door, it fell into the front room. And when I opened the window, it fell into the yard. And the ceiling was covered in horrible leaks and holes from the leaky roof and burn marks from the wiring that caused little fires. And uh, so this was too much for me. So I had to sit down to get, gather my thoughts. 
So I looked for a chair, and the only chair I could find was the toilet. So I sat upon the toilet and instantly fell through the floor with the toilet into years of accumulated human effluent. Um, so uh, it was not good, but uh, it gave me a great view of the plumbing under the floor. Uh, all of which I had to fix. <coughs> so the house was in really bad shape, but so was the neighborhood. And that's partly why we were able to afford the house. So most of the public uh, right-of-way looked like this. It was just bare dirt. The water would drain off into the street or into the house. And neighbors didn't really talk to one another because it was so uncomfortable. You didn't want to be outside where you could talk to your neighbor. Um, so uh, we uh, started knocking on doors and organizing gatherings and potluck dinners where we could meet our neighbors and talk to our neighbors. And we asked each other, what do we want as a community? And everybody wanted more life. Everybody wanted more exchange. So we organized the first of what has become an annual tree planting project. And we get everyone to, well, we try to get everyone out to come and plant trees together. So uh, uh, we have a friend that delivers the trees on bicycle trailer. We have meals before and after to bring people together. And uh, we also make a point of digging the basins to plant the rain before we plant the trees, like the African water farmer taught us. Um, and we would talk to the crossing guards that would walk the kids across the street. And we said, if we plant a tree, will you water it? And they said, no. And we said, why not? And they said, because I'm too old. By the time the tree is big, I will be dead. So we said, OK. But what about the kids that you're helping cross the street? You could water the tree for them so that they can enjoy the shade. And maybe their kids could enjoy the shade. This could be your legacy tree. So then they said, yes, I will water the tree. Um, So uh, this is how it looked in front of our house two years after planting the rain and planting the trees. Okay. So that's before and that's after. So we were not going to win any gardening awards. Okay because we had all these weeds, okay. But we wanted the weeds at first because we needed more organic matter in the soil. It was dead soil before we started. Um, and uh, we also made an earth uh, berm, a raised section of dirt. So when water came off the street, it did not go into the building, but instead gathered and created a small lake. So then we threw seed into the water, and then we got all this vegetation. So we were getting more life. Um, and we saw there was so much water we could get off the street we wanted more. So we started to uh, cut the, uh, the curb that was along the street. And we, this was not legal. This was illegal. 
So we did it on Sunday morning when no one from the city would watch. Okay. And we made really nice straight cuts. So we wanted to improve public property, not make it worse. Okay. And it worked so well collecting the water off the street into street side basins, our neighbors wanted to do the same thing because the vegetation grew so well. So we called the city and said, can we make this legal? Can we talk about this? And uh, it took a long time, but now it's legal and very easy permit. And you have to get a contractor, and they can do it like we did, or you can get bigger equipment and uh, do the same thing. And they improve, the city improved the design. They require that you grind out the cut afterwards so it's nice and smooth, looks better. And next to the street, we have to have a, a half a meter of a level platform that people can step onto when they get out of their parked car. So they don't step into a basin. They can come here and around. Okay? That was a key improvement. Um, so nobody falls into the basin. <laughs> um, and it is also legal to cut a, uh, a hole into the curb. It's cheaper but it's more likely to clog because it's a small opening. But you can easily clean it out. So how much water do we get from the street? Well, for every 100 millimeters of rain, a three meter wide paved street will get over 300,000 liters per kilometer. Okay? For every 100 millimeters, and you get 600. So multiply that by 6. And that's how much you get here off one kilometer of street. Okay? And if you increase the width, you get even more water. Yeah, so there's a question, what about the pollutants from the street, okay? So there will be more pollutants in the city than there will be in the country because there's more traffic. Um, but, and we're in the city, we're in the middle of the city. So we found that uh, we get a lot of heavy metals, hydrocarbons from the oil coming off the road, but there's no problem for the plants. They're just fine. The problem is if you were to plant vegetables or leafy greens, the, the toxins would come up into the plant. So we only plant woody perennials, so food-bearing trees. And there's no problem with the toxins. The toxins don't come into the fruit. Okay? Now, I don't know if this is the case with all fruit trees, but the trees that we tested, there was no problem. Okay. Um, and uh, what's even more interesting is because we are very careful to put organic mulch in the basins, that living sponge, We've had researchers at the university test our soil, and they have found that in less than three years, we went from relatively sterile urban soil to soil having the healthy ecology 
of that of soils of a healthy regional forest in, in less than three years. And we also found that when we had the organic mulch in the basins, we had 10 times the bioremediation ability in the soil that non-mulch soils had. Um, so the carbon of the leaf drop and the prunings that we put into the basin is the primary food source for the soil life, the microbes, the beneficial fungi, the beneficial bacteria. And some of them are able to uh, filter or transform the contaminants, um, some of the contaminants. So uh, this is another reason why that organic matter is so important. It not only makes a healthier soil, but it also enables the soil to clean out pollutants, to some degree at least. Is that yeah, true? For toxicants that can be absorbed by plants, okay, they will uh, just transform in uh, organic matters. Mm -hmm. But for example, for heavy metals, uh, they should be treated before, uh, or they are usually uh, 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 are treated like a special waste. If you uh, extract it by uh, a plant, the plant should be a special waste in the future. So how do you treat this kind of matter? Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's a problem. Everything is okay. <laughs> the, the, mm -hmm. the environment is much better than before. Yeah. But uh, in the future, that plants will be full of heavy metals if heavy metals are drained from the, from the, from the road. Yeah. Um, do, you, do, you, do you keep it in, in account when, uh, when you do it? I'll let her translate. And then okay. okay, so uh, we, um, we do not plant vegetables or leafy greens here that we would eat, okay? Um, but if we wanted to sequester the heavy metals, we could plant leafy greens to uptake the heavy metals. But we're not doing that. Um, so in this situation, the heavy metals are accumulating over time. But um, for the moment, we're choosing not to do anything about that because uh, we're careful about what we plant. And secondly, um, the heavy metals are, are in the land. We can't change it because people are driving every day and adding more. So we really need to stop or change the source of the heavy metals. And uh, so, we have not addressed everything that we could, but that's how we're doing it now. Um, okay, so it turns out this, so we cut the curb and make sure the basin is lower than the street. So water travels downhill to the basin. Then we make sure the pathway is at least as high as the curb so the water doesn't flood the adjoining property. So this acts like a backwater or an eddy, not a flow through system. So when water fills up the basin, no more water comes in. It just it fills up and backs up to the entry point. And then the uh, surplus continues down the street to the next one, fills up. Once it's full, <coughs> no more water comes in, but nothing leaves. So the mulch floats to the top of the water, and then when the water infiltrates, it goes back down. We don't lose mulch. We don't lose soil, OK? If it were a flow through system, if water came in here and then exited out here, then we might have 
some erosion or lose some mulch if we didn't design for that. But this is really easy. Okay, if we had a really steep road, like going like this, then uh, if we made a curb cut, we would have to make the basin go like this. It could not come down like this. Because if it was a really steep slope, if it came down, this point would be lower, that point would be lower than the inlet point. And water would flow this way, not this way. Does that make sense? Okay. So the steeper your slope, the shorter your basins are. The more gradual, they can be longer. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. <laughs> Question? You have soil uh, near the tree, but outside the, the rocks. Uh, what's that floor pavement? Uh, right here? Yeah. That's just dirt. So, um, yeah, in my neighborhood, there were no sidewalks, no, no concrete walkway. So it was very easy. Okay. But it's not only so. No. In uh, our street, we have uh, soil and then we have pavement floor. So yeah. it's difficult uh, that uh, water can go uh, in the ground. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Or, um, that water will be used only for that only tree and the other ones so i'll let her chance okay so uh i'll show you um in the next couple of days more photos more examples of more urban examples with more pavement but uh this um this waters this tree but also that tree those trees because the roots are going under the surface to each basin. Yes, but um, the roots uh, must have soil to grow. And must have air. It's yeah. not always uh, yeah. possible. Yeah. It's not usual in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it can be more challenging in real urban settings. Yeah, but we should think to uh, project our cities in a different way. It's not um, uh, in a short time, uh, in a short period of time, we, c we could uh, uh, apply this kind uh, of uh, water harvesting. Not always. Right. So sometimes what we'll do now, we have much wider streets in the U.S. than here. But uh, sometimes when we can't plant on the side of the street, we plant in the street. So I'll show some examples of that too, and that's just another strategy to start to change things. But you're right, we need to change the way we design cities in, in other ways too. Um, so more what I'm trying to do here is just show some of the ways we started change, and, to, and then I will show you other examples of, in other contexts how to make that change. So don't get stuck on how we did it. That's not so important. What's more important is that we were able in some way to plant the rain and generate more life. You might do it a different way elsewhere. Okay, um, okay. so we have now changed the ordinance. We've, sorry. My city has now passed a new ordinance that any time a new city street is built or an existing street is repaired to a large degree, the street must be designed and built to harvest at least, uh, okay, half inch, 
um, at least a at least 15 inches, 15 millimeters of rain. Is that right? 15 millimeters? That's a half an inch. Half an inch. 15 millimeters. No. Well, I don't know. Yeah, half an inch is one and a quarter centimeters. Un centimetro and cuarto. Okay. All right. So that's how much water we have to harvest at minimum on the side of the street or in the street. So I would prefer 25 millimeters, okay? So, but it's a start. So if there's a rainfall event with, sorry, how much was it again? Did you say a half an inch? Half an inch. Un centimetro and quarto. Okay, so um, a cent centimeter and a quarter, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So at a, a centimeter and a quarter uh, rainfall, all that water we will harvest. So I would rather it be more, but it's a great start because right now, all our streets, well, before anyway, all our streets were designed to drain all the water. But now it's shifting. So it's not a drain, but it's a harvester. I think that's a great shift. The beginning shift. Okay, and it's really important too because then we are able to grow more street trees which grow to shade and cool more of the street. Okay, which reduces water loss to evaporation. So by doing this neighborhood tree planting and planting the rain before we plant the trees, we converted that into this in 10 years. And it's only getting water from rainwater and the water from the street. No utility water, no imported water, only free local water. And we chose trees that uh, all the plants we chose produce food. Okay, uh, and medicine. But 90% of the plants are native to our area. Um, they're indigenous plants. So when we moved here, the only wild birds we had were exotic pigeons. No native birds, okay? Now, we have over two dozen native bird species have returned because their habitat has regrown. So what I love about this is before, I didn't know where I lived if I looked at the wildlife. I could be anywhere. Pigeons are everywhere, <laughs> okay? But when now, when I step outside, I know I am in the Sonoran Desert because I'm surrounded by the birds and the other wildlife unique to that place because its habitat has returned. So it helps me connect with the place. Okay. We also have found that crime has been reduced because now many neighbors like to walk up and down the path. And so we see our neighbors. We get to know one another. We actually talk to one another. So we actually live in a community, not just closed up houses. Okay. And we want to remember what change happened, that positive change is possible. So we put this sign with the before photograph in the same spot where we took that photograph so people can compare the difference and they can see, wow, it used to look like that. That's what my street looks like. I can change my street to look like that or something else. Um, so we see what's possible. Yeah. Uh, how do we keep the paths so clean? No, no. So uh, it's a good question. So we raise all our pathways. 
and we depress all the planting areas. So gravity is moving stuff off the path. And, um, and now, because we have so much vegetation established and we have so much mulch or organic matter, we don't have weeds. Because they, um, they can't outcompete the established vegetation. We have some weeds, but it's very few. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, no, okay. So we, here are some of the food plants that we plant in the public right-of-way, and that's my nephew harvesting the cactus fruit. And uh, so if we have food along the street, you're going to spend more time along the street. So then you're more likely to see a neighbor and get to know that neighbor and talk to them and so build the community even more. Um, and all these foods were grown for free in that, in front of our house, in that area that used to just be bare dirt. But now we have honey from the bees in our yard that visit the flowers. We've got prickly pear fruit jelly from the cactus fruit. We have wild chilies from the perennial chili plant. We grind up mesquite pods, which are like carob pods, and uh, grind that into a naturally sweet flour. We have olives from our olive trees, and uh, we have olives too, so. <laughs> and uh, choya buds from the choya cactus. Okay. And all just on rainwater and street water. And, and we get less than half of the rain you get. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I love that you have olive, co olive press co-ops. And you have... So, um, sometimes co-op mills for grinding grain. We don't have that anymore. And when you want to grind up the mesquite pods into, natu into flour, uh, it's difficult. It's a lot of hard work. So we bought a farm scale mill that we put on a trailer and we take to different neighborhoods so people can grind up their pods into flour. So this much uh, pods you can grind up into this much flour in five minutes. And you can sell this much flour for 200 US dollars. Okay because it's not easy to find. <laughs> and it's very delicious, it's naturally sweet, and it slows the body's intake of sugar. So it's a great food for people with hypoglycemia or diabetes. Prosopis velatina. Yeah. No. So the mesquite, it's like an acacia tree, but it's Prosopis velatina. Pros Yeah. Can you spell the Latin name? Mm -hmm. or Is there a whiteboard? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um.
So uh, some people would harvest, but many people did not. So uh, we would have uh, mesquite pancake breakfasts with prickly pear syrup. Or we would have a bake sale with many of these different foods. So people could taste it and say, oh, I like this. And they would get excited like him. <laughs> and they would want to do likewise. So we would then sell them the cookbook that would tell them how to plant the tree after planting the water and how you can then harvest it and process it and store it. So more and more people started to do it. And this is just one tree. So this was the bait to invite people in. So in my area, there's over 400 native food-bearing plants. So we also have peanut trees. We have barley trees, okay? Trees with edible flowers. So when people get excited about mesquite, we tell them about the other trees. Okay. And if you, okay, so, um, a, uh, a Tohono O'odham, or an indigenous elder, that walks through past our yard, sees food everywhere. But the typical modern American doesn't know any of these foods. So we're trying to re-educate ourselves. Um. Okay, so uh, we were so successful Along the street, we decided to work in the street. So this is some examples, but wider streets. <laughs> so we started to create roundabouts where before there was none. And we made sure we depressed the ground so that the water could go in. And then we got neighbors to plant it, not the city. Because if the city plants it, everybody thinks the city will take care of it. If the neighbors plant it, they know they have to take care of it. Okay. Um, and we had a lot of people speeding through our neighborhood and causing a lot of accidents. So this slowed down traffic. It made the neighborhood safer. It harvested water, reduced flooding. And then we painted the street, and that really slowed down traffic. People would be driving, and then what the, what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we used uh, the wrong paint. We used safe, non-toxic paint. So after a month, it was all gone. <laughs> it vanished. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. We still had the traffic circle, and we had some art we put in. So this art piece is a crossroad sign. Each sign points to another element in the neighborhood or near the neighborhood. In the very top, it says the name of the neighborhood, and it, above that is a weather vane of a family of Gamble's quail birds. Because there used to be quail all over Tucson. But when many neighborhoods were built and their habitat destroyed, we lost the quail. But research at the university found if you plant 10 to 15 percent of your property in native plants, that's enough habitat to bring back the gambles quail. So, all these plants, all these plants are examples 
of the plants that bring back the quail and give us food. So now, the quail are coming back. So we can eat quail and pigeon. <laughs> okay. If you want to. Or you don't eat them. <laughs> okay. So uh, then um, the, uh, we also cut the asphalt out there and made this basin that's uh, about this deep. Um, fills with water. Oh, I didn't change that to metric. I'm sorry, I forgot to convert the uh, English units to metric. Um, but uh, we can harvest a lot of water. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, it. All I know is a gallone sono 4 litri, quindi dividendo 660 per 4, sapete quanti litri. A gallon is 4 litres, you can divide 4 into 660,000. No, per sapere. Ah, un gallone sono 4 litri, sì, molto poco al 4. Un litro per 4 e sai quanti litri sono, poi la legge tutto quello che è. What are chicanes? Chicanes? They're these pull-outs that um, you pull the planting area into the street. So the street used to be like that, but we cut that out and then dug it out and then planted this there. So it, it, tr it narrows the street, so cars drive slower, and it also protects everyone that parks on the street. So uh, we got a, a grant uh, for some money to do this in our neighborhood, and uh, it also paid for some art. So this sculpture of the fish uh, turning around, uh, it is the Sonora sucker fish. This is a fish that you used to be able to fish in my neighborhood. You used to be able to fish your dinner and then go for a swim in my neighborhood 70 years ago. That's now all gone because we killed the river. Okay? Uh, so this tells us of what we lost, but it also shifts people's perception of what's possible because the fact that there used to be fishable fish is so different than the situation today. So it, it's depressing that we lost the fish. <laughs> but in the fish is a horned lizard. So a horned lizard has adapted to living in very dry conditions and it has learned to harvest rainwater. So when it rains, this, this lizard will raise its rear legs and it flares out its back to make more surface area and then the water hitting its back gets caught in microscopic gutters between its scales and it comes right to its mouth. Okay, So this is also meant to show everyone in the neighborhood we can do like the horned lizard and we can harvest water instead of draining it. And this is an example within this chicane that's harvesting water. And you can do it other ways, too. Okay. All right. So, so those are just a few examples of how uh, we are now harvesting water in our neighborhood and in front of our property. And now, many neighborhoods in Tucson are doing this. And as I told you, now the city's changing the laws. Now it's legal. Now it's encouraged. Now you can get paid for doing it. 
And it all started just from an example. So when we first called the city after we had cut the street curb and said we wanted a meeting, they met with us. But three weeks after the first meeting, we got a very angry phone call from the city. And they said, we just drove by your house and we saw you already cut the curb, but we haven't made it legal yet. So we said, yeah, okay, but we actually cut the curb three years ago. <laughs> it's working great. Why don't we look at this as an experimental pilot project that we can learn from? And they said, yes, thankfully. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, it was the city being able to see how well that worked, neighbors seeing how well it worked, wanting to do likewise. That's what enabled the political will in the city to make this change. Okay. So I will show you many other water harvesting strategies and examples as we go on with the workshop. But I want to end this presentation here by coming back to the questions I began with. And I want you to again ask yourself, what could be the story of your place? And what will be your role in that story? And if you don't like the story of your place, if you don't like your role in that story, think about how you can change it. Because it's my belief that we all have the power to choose our role and to change our story. And it's my hope that with this info and this workshop, you will choose to shift your story and your role in a regenerating, life-enhancing way. And for the rest of the workshop, it's my hope I will give you tools and ideas to do that. <laughs> uh, any questions on any of that? Is it raining? It's raining? Yeah. That's free of charge. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, I've got uh, the books. I have two copies up here. If, uh, or I did, one, oh, there's the other one. Um, if you all want to look through them, I'll just have them up here. But if you want to buy any of the books, I've got them for sale too at a reduced event price. Um, and uh, uh, also lots of free info on the website. But I apologize that it's all in English. Um, however, um, the handouts that, for this workshop that have been translated into Italian, I will put those on the website too. Um, and uh, if if you or anyone you know would like to see any of these books in Italian, uh, please speak to me, because I'd love to work it out to get them in Italian. So. Yeah? All right. Okay. <laughs> Moving forward with Nico on that. Awesome. Uh, wow. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, any, any questions from the... First part, yeah. Uh, you said that you use the uh, plants which are on the, your place. Yeah. But you prefer the plants uh, that the roots go uh, horizontally or vertically? Hmm. Which kind? Okay. Do, should I say, do you want to turn? Uh, allora, preferite plants. Okay. So I like to go for both. Um, 
But for the street trees, I don't want shallow roots because they'll heave the sidewalk. And uh, so I go for deep rooted trees along the street. Um, but uh, then the understory plants, like the shrubs under the trees, I'll go for shallow roots. So I'm getting roots at every level of the soil. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, in some areas it's only this deep, um, and then we hit uh, caliche, which is calcium carbonate. Uh, it's a hard pan of, it's like limestone, but not quite. Limestone's nicer. And uh, so there'll be cracks in the calcium carbonate. So with a pickaxe, we'll break through deep enough for the root ball of the plant. And then we let the roots break up the rest. Okay. So it's, it's somewhat similar to here. But we don't have clay soil. You have clay soil. Um, we have more sandy loam soil. But you can do everything I talked about, you can do in clay soil. But it's important that you add more organic matter because the clay soil uh, is less absorptive of water without the organic matter. Okay. Uh huh. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, especially tomorrow, I'll show you a lot of strategies you can use in your yard, in your garden, too. So I know there's a lot of gardeners. <laughs> okay. So, um, are we breaking at one, or do we do a little more exercise outside? <laughs> One thirty? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, is it raining hard or just a little? Drops. Okay. Uh, because the um. Uh, okay, I can do one thing in the rain. Um. We, yeah, <laughs> we could. So uh, let's see if we can go outside. If it's too wet for you, you can stand under the roof, and I'll go in the rain and do the demonstration. <laughs> so I don't, do I wear this thing? <laughs> 